Hey team, Andre from High Performance Academy. Welcome along to another one of our webinars. And today we're going to be covering what is a relatively short and simple topic. Balance shaft removal on the 4G63 engine. And while it is a short and relatively simple topic, it is one of those uh, areas where there's a few different ways of going about the balance shaft removal. And I've seen people get it wrong, including ourselves back in the early days. And this can cause a fairly catastrophic failure of the oil pump with uh, the results of the rest of the engine probably following not too far behind. So we'll talk about the pros and cons of balance shafts in general, why uh, we we may choose to remove them and then the different options that are available and of course uh, what we recommend uh, to get maximum reliability. Uh, before we get into that though, a uh, bit of an update on the SR86. Now our members webinar that we ran two weeks ago gave a bit of an update which uh, got a fair number of comments as we totally expected when it hit YouTube because we did suffer from an engine failure. Now, this isn't uh, related to anything we've done. Uh, it was a situation where we ended up with the main bearing caps cracking or three I think of the two or three of the five bearing ca main bearing caps cracking. Now this is something that does, it is a no one fault with the SR20, but usually at much higher power levels than what we're seeing. And again, for those who maybe haven't been following along with the journey, we really aren't pushing this or weren't pushing this engine particularly hard. Uh, for endurance racing, we're making around 430 to 450 horsepower. So uh, well within the bounds of what was what we realistically expect. And we've had a whole bunch of people tell us that the Nissan SR20 just is an unreliable engine and we should case swap it. We've already gone over that in our last video as well. What I'll say here is that every engine has its weaknesses, every engine has problems and the problems we've had particularly with this engine are not common faults of the SR20. Uh, we have unfortunately had more than our fair share I believe of bad luck and as I replied to one of the comments from our last video What's important to understand is that here we really aren't trying to reinvent the wheel. Uh, there have been a few problems that got built into the car early on in the piece which really were the culmination of us trying to achieve a complete engine swap and fully rewiring the car in four and a half weeks. In hindsight obviously a completely crazy aim with everything else we had going on at the same time. So of course uh, when you are working against a very tight time frame uh, this limits what we can do. So there were a few problems that were built into that, a few completely unrelated problems but again I'll stand behind the fact that what we're trying to do with the engine uh, is definitely been done hundreds if not thousands of times before. Uh, so I don't think we're trying to step into uncharted territory. Uh, the other thing Thing though that comes along with this is that uh, basically any professional engine builder, tuner, performance workshop essentially out there, probably what you'll find is obviously if you're dealing with a quality workshop, 99.9% .9 of their jobs will go relatively smoothly from start to finish and you just get the expected results. It's actually pretty damn boring if I'm honest. Unfortunately, every now and then you get what I refer to as a problem child, which is exactly what we've got here. Now, I don't want to discourage people because this is the point I made in the comments. Uh, people are sort of looking at this and going, well, if High Performance Academy is having these problems with a low powered SR20, what hope does the rest of the world have? And, and that's completely unreasonable. Again, 99.9% .9 of the time, everything is going to go completely smoothly. It's going to go even smoother if you're dealing with the engine in the native factory uh, chassis which unfortunately we're not and again without going too deep into the details uh, with the engine swap that built in a few problems that we had to deal with early on particularly around the cooling system. So no it, it's definitely not the norm. Fortunately these problem children that I refer to here they are well and truly the exception not the norm. However, just to catch us up on where we left off last time, uh, we were in a situation where we had two weeks to go before our last and final round of the Endurance Series. We'd sourced another engine block and we'd sourced a set of Plasma Man uh, billet caps and a girdle. We'll jump across to my laptop screen just to refresh those who maybe haven't been following along. This is basically what it looks like. So uh, we replaced the factory cast caps with these nice chunky billet caps, much, much stronger, better quality material. And 
one of the issues with the factory Nissan caps is uh, they're in a genius effort. There is actually a, a bolt hole uh, drilled and tapped right at the thinnest point of the cap. Uh, the idea behind this is it allows the cap to be removed during engine disassembly. I, I totally get that. Uh, and I guess in a factory form it works just fine, but of course it is a weak point in a high powered engine. So uh, these do away with that and it is just one solid chunk of billet steel so great to have those in there and then uh, to go along with that as you can see in the background there the black cradle or girdle that ties all of those caps together just like the factory one does but it goes one step further and actually uh, ties them into the outer rails or sump rails of the block as well so basically making the whole bottom end of the engine a lot more rigid now the problem with this is, well it's not really a problem, it's just an essential element of doing anything like this, is that when you're replacing the factory caps with billet, you need to have the engine line board and then a line honed. And basically what that does is, it gets this tunnel here uh, back to being perfectly round hopefully much much rounder than that horrible circle that I just drew. Uh, it's really important for the, the journal there to be at the factory size and there's a very very fine tolerance between the maximum minimum size that it needs to be there plus also it needs to be perfectly round or at least in an ideal world and that's going to give us the correct amount of crush on the bearing bearing shelves that go in there and in turn it's also going to give us the correct amount of bearing clearance between the bearing surfaces and the crankshaft journal so that's an essential element and in effect it's something that we do with an alloy block anyway when we fit the likes of an ARP stud because the extra, cl extra clamping force alone uh, can distort those components. Uh, again we're working on a fairly, fairly tight time frame, we found a uh, machinist who was capable of doing that task, however uh, when we got the engine block back with one week to go we found that the, a little bit of an error had crept in there and uh, the caps were actually located incorrectly. Now, in the SR20 what we, we find is that the centre main cap is one millimetre thicker than the other four and the reason that that is thicker is that it retains the thrust washers. Uh, now unfortunately the caps that we actually used aren't the ones that I'm showing you here. Again if we jump to my photo here, my thumb's actually just covering it, but these ones are a, a revision and I think the revision has probably been done for this very reason. SR20, straightforward. Uh, what my thumb's covering there is a, a CNC machined marking for which location in the block that particular cap has to go with. Uh, the ones that we sourced were an earlier version. Again, we're really uh, up against the clock. So uh, we actually pulled in a favor and borrowed some that were already in New Zealand uh, for a job that hadn't been completed. And we replaced them with these ones that Plasma Man sent us. The earlier ones don't have that marking. What they do have is a very subtle T marked on that main bearing cap for the center because it's for the thrust washer location but that's very easy to overlook and in the defense to the machinist that we did use I, I can see how this mistake could creep in but again uh, seems like our bad luck just keeps on following us around and uh, basically the cap was placed in location four and when I went to dummy assemble the engine and rotated the crankshaft it spat the thrust washers out because there wasn't anything to stop them from moving. So we were basically stuck there, there was no solution to get us racing, sent the block back and anyway got it reassembled and this time it was good to go. Uh, so nothing here that really should have created in itself any more power and again I, I genuinely believe it, the four. 30, 450 horsepower mark. These uh, caps really should not be an essential item, but for the relatively small cost in the big scheme of things, obviously we weren't going to take chances a second time around. Now we've got it back on the dyno and uh, we've been racing this car for one hour endurance races and purposely we've, we've kept the power a little bit lower for that application as I've just said 430 to 450 horsepower we did have a push to pass that took us up to 500 horsepower. Now in terms of boost pressure we're running the Garrett GTX 3076R Gen 2 still at this point. We're going to be swapping to a G25 660 shortly and hoping to get a little bit better boost response. The GTX is quite lazy uh, for the power we're making and I really wanted to move the boost curve uh, more to the left because we don't want to rev this engine too high. So for the endurance racing we were running it at 1 bar 15 psi so that's what's making that 430 odd 450 horsepower and off the top of my head uh, the 500 horsepower mark we were using the push to pass running up to 18. So again 
not overly stressed, particularly given we're running on an E85, really conservative tune, not a heap of timing and relatively fat with the mixture. Again, just really wanted to keep the thing alive. Obviously that didn't work, but uh, we certainly can't blame the uh, tune up on the cracked uh, main bearing cap so we put that down to a vibration potentially which I discussed in our last video. Anyway uh, back on the dyno we were coming up to a sprint race and given we've had such amazing reliability from the engine so far we thought uh, well we'll see what it actually can do with a little bit more boost. Still wasn't really pushing it too far but uh, 568 wheel horsepower or 423.7 kilowatts and that was on 23 psi 23 0.5 psi I think 160 kPa give or take so uh, still plenty left in the tank and so much as our exhaust manifold back pressure is still uh, not really skyrocketing uh, and we've still got uh, a fair bit of boost up our sleeve if we really wanted to push it which I definitely do not this was uh, really one of those uh, Hail Mary runs on the dyno just to see uh, what it was going to produce. Interestingly, and again, if you've been following for a while, uh, you will already know about this because I've talked about it. You can see that uh, the dyno power is actually still rising at the end of that run. That run was to 7,800, 850 RPM, it even says so there. Uh, and when we, when we ran the engine uh, a season ago with the Calford cams, we we're actually making peak power at about 8,800, which was way too high for what we were trying to do for endurance racing. And in t terms of aiding our reliability or giving us the best shot possible. I wanted to pull that all the way back. So I actually only run it to about 7600 RPM on the racetrack at the moment. And we have swapped to a Primera P12 cam, which helped move the power curve across to the left. But as you can see, uh, it, it clearly still wants to keep revving. Probably, uh, I'd say if we'd let it, it'll probably make power, peak power somewhere uh, a little bit north of 8000. But again, uh, it is what it is for the time being and pretty reasonable power, I believe, for the 23 odd PSI of boost that we were running. Uh, so on the weekend, got the chance to get it to the track. However, uh, unfortunately, well fortunately actually as it turns out, uh, it was absolutely torrential rain, which always makes things a little bit more exciting. Uh, the car though, honestly, I I'm really struggle to believe how much grip uh, this car actually has in the wet. And a large part of that comes down to the change in tyre. Uh, so obviously we're not running a full slick on a wet track and we are running the latest generation of Michelin full wet tyre. And I don't know what these are made out of, some kind of magic, but they genuinely seem to defy uh, defy physics. Uh, if I just pull up some data here. So this is uh, from the second race on the weekend. So this was literally torrential rain, full wipers on, and actually just after this race, they actually red flagged the track for about 30 minutes because there was so much standing water. Uh, so of interest here, Let's just get rid of a couple of channels that probably aren't so interesting. Uh, but the centre here is our lateral and longitudinal g-force and uh, if we look at our peaks here uh, the light blue is lateral so cornering force uh, a peak of positive 1.3 g or negative 1.43 g now there is a bank quarter here which kind of tends to play with uh, things a little bit but I mean ultimately anytime uh, you're pulling in excess of 1.2, 1.3 G and you've got the windscreen wipers on full uh, that is a pretty special tyre. Uh, I will probably also add some thanks there to top stage for the uh, downforce, the aero package that we've got on the car. Uh, obviously particularly at higher speed uh, that's genuine. Uh, genuinely helping us out there. Uh, ran the car up to about 20 psi for these sprint races because they are uh, only six lap races and uh, that was somewhere a little bit north of 500 horsepower at the tyre so being able, be able to put that power to the track uh, and it really was uh, gripped up pretty well from second gear onwards um, only really had the traction control cut in very briefly on a couple of occasions so really really impressive uh, and I'm still really learning the car really learning to trust it so uh, no doubt there's a bit more in it. Uh, I do just have a short little video here that I just wanted to play uh, which shows these were a, these are a rolling start so uh, I 
I kind of ended up P2 and qualifying. So to my right here, which you'll see in a second, we've got a Porsche 991 GT3 Cup car. And behind me in P3, there's a Porsche 997 Cup car, a couple of GT4 Caymans after that. So kind of felt like I was well and truly out of my league. So this is just coming up to uh, the rolling start. We'll just play this and talk about it. Uh, so coming up here, but a good run on the car. Uh, to my right, but uh, we're coming up here, we're actually running a shortened version of Highlands Motorsport Park. So we basically turn right and shortcut the track straight after the start finish straight. So being that I really don't want to damage the car, didn't want to damage the Porsche, uh, gave a little bit more racing room and didn't try anything silly going around the outside here. Uh, but the ability to actually kind of stick within reason, reason uh, behind this uh, 991 GT3 Cup car, uh, I, I was pretty impressed with just how competitive the, the little 8.6 was and uh, I feel like it's really kind of uh, batting a little bit above uh, above its weight for, for what we've done to it, particularly uh, where we've still got a hell of a lot of development left in the car. Uh, ultimately at the end of the 6 lap race I think uh, the 991 was about 3 seconds uh, up the road ahead of me, uh, we had a comfortable margin to, uh, to P3 behind but uh, yeah it was uh, pretty good, it was pretty good until uh, again the problem child struck. Uh, this time nothing too major, uh, but uh, if we just jump across to my laptop screen here, uh, towards the end of the second race, I ended up with a low battery warning come up on the dash. I only had uh, about a lap and a half left to go, so I deemed it, given we had 11.8 uh, volts still at that point, uh, I deemed that it was uh, worth still continuing. And when I got back into the pits, had a look and found that the bracket for our alternator had snapped so it spat off the alternator belt and of course uh, no more alternator charging. Now a couple of things about this, it is an alloy bracket, uh, in hindsight it's probably uh, a little bit smaller than we should have gone with it, uh, obviously everything's always 20-20 uh, in hindsight though, everything's really obvious with the benefit of hindsight, uh, but uh, this probably also plays into the vibrations that I have been talking about with the car. Uh, aluminium is uh, very susceptible to fatigue related failure and vibration does cause this. We interestingly had uh, a very similar failure with the factory alternator bracket on the original 1UZFE in this car as a result of the vibration we were getting from the TTI gearbox and back then admittedly it was much better yeah, it was a little bit better uh, when we when we were running the TTI behind the SR20. Uh, the very first time we ran the TTI box behind the 1UZFE, uh, the track we were at were about 245k in sixth gear at the end of the long front straight. And at that point, the vibration was so bad uh, that I couldn't see out of the mirrors. So that gives you some idea of the intensity. On the 1UZFE, it created, it caused the alternator bracket to break twice. We also had the inlet manifold crack as a result of those vibrations. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going out on a limb here. Obviously, I can't guarantee that's what the, the sole, sole issue is but it kind of ties into uh, the problem we've had with those bearing caps as well. Regardless, we're going to remake that bracket much stronger. Uh, given the relatively small size of it, probably just end up making it out of steel. Uh, the weight deficit's probably not really worth worrying about. So there you go, the uh, the curse of the SR86 strikes again. Fortunately this time a relatively quick and easy fix, but uh, sadly not one we could make at the track. So a little bit of a, a, a down period in our racing now. Uh, I don't think we've got much, much more going on until the middle of January, so we'll probably be a little bit quieter on that front. We've got a few things that we want to work through, uh, a few other aspects to the car that we didn't get a chance to finish before uh, the race series started, like the full flat floor to link the top stage front splitter to the rear diffuser. Uh, and we can work through those little aspects over the off season before we get stuck in again mid middle of January. So again, we'll keep you up to date. Right, I just wanted to quickly cover off uh, a Instagram that I put up uh, just a couple of days ago. So this is uh, a Leighton House 891, March Leighton House 891 Formula 1 car. This is a photo uh, that I took when we were over at Goodwood Festival of Speed. But interestingly, this car was actually restored uh, here in New Zealand and shipped off to, uh, to Goodwood. So uh, some pretty cool stuff being done here on some pretty relevant and uh, historic F1 race cars. Uh, so the, the uh, con the 
topic here is just uh, what we tend to see in terms of suspension design on open wheel cars, not always just F1 cars, but uh, what we see with the suspension design and why. Uh, so it's pretty common you'll see just about any open wheel race car running an inboard suspension system like this where uh, the damper and spring unit is mounted up inside the bodywork rather than connected directly to uh, the hub like we would see with a conventional uh, road going car or modified road going race car. And uh, the there's a couple of benefits as to why that is the case. Uh, the key one, and this really is a big driver behind uh, just about any uh, open wheel race car, but obviously the epitome of F1 is the aerodynamic downforce. So basically cleaning up the aerodynamics of the car is really critical. And as you can see there, the spring and damper unit is quite big and bulky. Uh, if that was hanging out there in the airflow, it's going to create a lot of drag, but the other aspect is it creates uh, a lot of dirty airflow rearward of the shock and damper unit and the subtle aspect of that is it affects the way all of the downstream aero components can work when there's dirty air uh, flowing onto them so getting those out of the airflow is really critical to get the uh, reduce the drag and also clean up the airflow onto those other components as an element of that as well while it's a little hard to see in this photo you can see that uh, all of the uh, suspension arms there are an aerodynamic sort of streamlined shape as well just again to to uh, reduce juice drag. Now there are a couple of other benefits though and this comes down to the way the suspension is or the damper is actuated. So this is a bell crank system here uh, and it is actuated by a push rod. Uh, these can be actuated as a pull rod system as well but essentially for all intents and purposes the principles are relatively similar. The key point is the geometry of that rocker system can be manipulated so that the relationship between the wheel motion, so in other words how much the, the wheel travels versus how much the damper travels uh, can be varied as the wheel goes through its motion. And what this means is that it's possible to create a rising rate geometry in terms terms of the spring rate so basically uh, from ride height there's less resistance to wheel movement as the wheel goes further and further into bump travel uh, the resistance is the effective spring rate or the wheel rate as it's more correctly referred to becomes stiffer so there's a, a lot of tunability benefits in that. Uh, there are also other benefits in terms of reducing the unsprung weight of the vehicle as well which is beneficial to help the wheel properly uh, track uh, irregularities in the track. Uh, now another part which is a little bit hard to see unfortunately with this as well is it does also integrate the uh, the anti-roll bar so that's actually mounted down behind this so the anti-roll bar is actuated I think from memory it's off uh, these little push rods here that run off the rocker uh, so it, it makes the whole anti-roll bar system much more much more compact uh, which also obviously means that it is much lighter so a little bit of insight into what goes on uh, in a well, not so modern F1 car but essentially uh, it's still much of a muchness as to what they're doing these days. Interestingly uh, this car was designed by Adrian Newey uh, who is the technical director now for Red Bull F1 and uh, he's probably one of the most influential uh, technical directors, F1 designers out there, particularly his work in aerodynamics. So uh, if you are interested in finding out a little bit more about Adrian Newey and uh, his, his life in F1, uh, he's got a book out which I really, really Really enjoyed called How to Build a Car. Uh, could not recommend that highly enough. So check that out if you are a bit of an F1 fan. Uh, right, I'll just head back over to my photos here and I just wanted to give you an update uh, on a slightly different project than what you're probably used to seeing from from us at High Performance Academy and uh, this is actually my own daily driver well hopefully uh, in the not too distant future we'll get back to being my daily driver so uh, again if we head over to my photos uh, this is a 1982 Toyota FJ40 uh, to be specific this is actually referred to as a BJ40 because it runs the 3B diesel engine. Uh, I've always loved these trucks uh, they have a really cool look that I don't think you get too much these days but uh, there are some 
some significant downsides in terms of the agricultural technology from a 1980s truck. Uh, actually, I think the design originated back from about the 60s, so not a lot of uh, advances were made in that time. So what I wanted to do was basically keep the external look of the truck as much as possible. Uh, a few modifications, but uh, generally the look and feel I wanted to keep the same, but I wanted to modernise it, make it uh, basically drive like a modern car, uh, bit more power, doesn't really need much power, it's definitely not a race car, uh, but it also fix the problems such as the lack of power steering and the drum brakes. So uh, fast forward, we've probably gone a little bit further than we'd expected, but that's how these projects normally go. Uh, so one of the things we wanted to do was a full coilover conversion, so we can see uh, that's exactly what we've got going on in here. Uh, we've retained the original FJ40 diffs, uh, however we will be uh, upgrading some of the components that are known of failure points, such as the axles there. I've also gone to the extent of putting hydraulic bump stops in the truck as well. Uh, the engine, which we can see in here, is a Toyota 3U ZFE. For some reason, these trucks are really popular to have uh, 350 Chev uh, carbureted, normally 350 Chev engines dropped into them. I generally like wherever possible to keep the same manufacturer engine as chassis, and I know uh, the Toyota SR86 is basically flying in the face of exactly what I'm saying now, but that was done for a very particular reason, and uh, maybe if we'd had a bit more time, that wouldn't have been the way we'd gone. So anyway, this one wanted to keep it true to its Toyota roots. Uh, something would just actually arrived today, which may or may not be problematic for it. Uh, I managed to find a set of Brembo four-pot calipers, and um, this is kind of the usual uh, sort of online trading mistake that I've now fallen into. There wasn't a lot of scale on the photos, so I assumed 4-pot Brembo caliper is going to be the same that we see on the likes of Subaru STI, Mitsubishi, Lancer Evo, etc. Uh, you know, designed to sit under a 17-inch wheel pretty happily. Uh, I don't actually know what these are from, uh, but it looks from the size of them that they were probably designed for something that rolled on a 20-inch wheel. Uh, we've got 17-inch... 1552 wheels on this truck so I think at a casual glance we should be able to make them work but uh, definitely uh, it's fair to say that they are overkill. Another thing in terms of modernising the truck was the transmission so uh, in stock form they run a pretty clunky a pretty agricultural four speed box uh, so we've gone with a Toyota R151F five speed box and transfer case uh, a bit of mixing and matching here to get the parts to work with the offset drive shaft that we needed for the FJ40 diff but essentially the this is the same transmission that we see in a late model uh, Toyota Hilux so it should be a little bit nicer to drive with that transmission. Uh, at the rear of the car here, it's looking forward, uh, the leaf springs have been ditched, again we've gone coil over and this runs a four link with, as you can see, these top two links here uh, are angled and the reason they're angled here is that this does the lateral location so it doesn't require a pan hard rod. Uh, the front of the truck uh, has been converted to a five link so uh, lots of stuff going on there, that again is another shot of the rear with the uh, coil over, I haven't got springs for it yet because we need to do a little bit more weighing of components uh, before we actually calculate the spring rate and uh, we've got the strap here that uh, controls the maximum uh, droop travel and again hydraulic bump stop. Uh, one of the things we are working on uh, probably doesn't look too flash. This is a cardboard mock-up for a fuel tank that's going to be made. Uh, we're actually going to be covering that in an upcoming course, which is uh, our TIG welding fundamentals course. For those who aren't aware, we are bringing our ETS fabrication school courses into High Performance Academy. Uh, we're hoping before the end of the year, we will be releasing our first, which is our fabrication fundamentals course. Uh, following up from that, we've got a TIG welding, a practical TIG welding, practical MIG welding course, and uh, we will also be bringing out next year a roll cage course. So part of this will be fabricating, designing and fabricating this aluminium uh, fuel tank that's going to go into the back of the FJ. So again, I know it's a little bit different to our usual projects, but uh, hopefully a few of you out there will appreciate what we're trying to do here. Uh, it's going to run some modern electronics as well, Motec ECU and uh, P PDM, and we will also be doing a full uh, race spec wiring harness for the truck, uh, which will be featured in our professional motorsport wiring course as a full worked example. 
All right, we're running a little bit long here. I just will finish up quickly by talking about the latest episode of our HPA Tuned In podcast. If you aren't already aware of this, we have been running a podcast for a couple of months now and it covers basically anything new, cool in the automotive world. We've been interviewing some really exciting, really interesting people and uh, the last two episodes that have launched uh, in episode 13, we discussed uh, designing a bespoke this uh, sorry Nissan a bespoke Honda K24 based 4.8 litre V8 with Craig from Neutron Engines and if you haven't been following Craig on Instagram let's just jump across to his Instagram for a moment just to give you a bit of an idea of what he's doing. Uh, this guy is uh, a real rocket scientist and he gets really deep into the design and development of all of the components that are going into this engine and just as importantly he shares exactly what he's doing and why he's doing it. So this is designed to ultimately be a production based V8 uh, in either naturally aspirated or twin turbo or single turbo form. Uh, the uh, Some of the, the cool stuff he's done with this as well is he has designed it to take uh, aspects such as uh, alias engine mounts, so making it really easy to swap into uh, chassis that are designed for the alias engine. Uh, quite a lot smaller in most instances than the alias as well, significantly lighter. Uh, Stretching my memory, I think it's designed in naturally aspirated form to make about 750 horsepower and I think from memory about 10, 10 and a half thousand RPM. Uh, so if you want to find out more about what goes into that and learning how to use uh, Fusion 360 for 3D modelling, uh, check that out. Uh, also our latest episode is with Lucas English from English Racing and uh, English Racing I've been following them for decades because of their involvement with the Mitsubishi platform back when I was drag racing. They currently hold the world record for the fastest Mitsubishi Evo 10. Uh, they also are I think number two or three on the late model Evo 789 platform uh, well into the sevens, I think 770, maybe 192, don't quote me on that. Uh, but we talked to Lucas about uh, the 4B11 versus the 4G63, some of the strategies that he uses for drag racing, particularly really interesting about his use of drive-by wire throttle uh, for torque management to get the car out of the hole and to the 60 foot quickly and repeatedly. Uh, so you can find the HPA TuneIn podcast wherever you currently listen to podcasts uh, or check it out at hpa-tunedin.com. All right, as I said, we've gone a little bit long there, so we'll finish up there. Thanks for watching. Uh, give me a moment and we'll get started with today's lesson. If you liked that video, make sure you give it a thumbs up. And if you're not already a subscriber, make sure you're subscribed. We release a new video every week. And if you like free stuff, we've got a great deal for you. Click the link in the description to claim your free spot to our next live lesson.